Hopefully slides will change from this point. Um, our discussion today is on the uh, southern portion of the American plate. We've been around from the eastern side and across the Arctic Ocean and down almost to Japan, across the uh, uh, arc of volcanoes to Alaska and down the western margin of uh, North America. But now we've got a rather more complex area, uh, southern margin, perhaps we won't go into it fully because uh, it's subject for another day. We'll also cut off and uh, do something on Galapagos. So um, just a brief look at that. Now that's what we were doing last week, uh, an extraordinary complex western margin of the North American plate where it's uh, being undercut, you might say, by the eastern half of the Pacific Ocean and the uh, Yuan de Fuca plate, which is the opposite uh, mirror image plate to the real Pacific plate, which occupies most of the Pacific Ocean, really, um, because half of it is under North America and uh, slipping down uh, a thousand meters into the mantle. So as we slide down there, we got to um, where the Central Ridge uh, passed a triple point and went into the San Andreas Fault, which is a sort of clockwise or right-hand moving transverse fault called Transfer Fault because it's actually transferring between two triple points essentially um, on the um, what is left of the mid um, Pacific Ridge. Anyway, as we get down to the uh, Gulf of California, we're effectively seeing Bahia Peninsula being cut off from the North American plate and slid northward. And uh, you have a series of red patches, which are the spreading ridges trying to grow ocean, but they're being pulled apart by transverse faults like the San Andreas. Um, so that that net effect is that the Bahia California is moving northward relative to the um, USA. And as we come further south, we meet another triple point and a new plate appears, the Cocos plate, which is more or less the equivalent of that Yuan de Fuca plate. It's the eastern half of the Pacific Ocean in that region, the Pacific plate occupying most of the uh, oceanic area and the Cocos plate just being inserted or being remnant, you might say, hasn't yet subducted beneath the uh, North American plate. So that's the region we're looking at. And uh, you can see the uh, effect of the San Andreas, a huge plain in there um, stretching north from uh, Los Angeles and so forth. Many of you will know the topography. And that great width that, to the uh, Rocky Mountains, which is due to the uh, subducting plate being relatively shallow, I believe, and uh, having its influence with uprising heat and causing the uplift that's resulted in the canyons and the uh, uh, basin and range structure, which is this peculiar sand ridge-like area um, just to the uh, three, four o'clock position on the picture, just east of the uh, Gulf of California. Those are all individual fault slices. It's extraordinary chopping up like mincemeat, isn't it? Anyway, as we move southward from that, the North American plate um, meets with a mini plate and then um, a series of very active areas in Southern Mexico, volcanoes and earthquakes and things, and then uh, skips eastward to the north of the Caribbean plate, which is central in the diagram and goes across all the way to the um, um, central Atlantic Ridge, which was where we started our conversation a month ago. So that defines the North American plate effectively. There's quite a bit of complexity there in the Caribbean plate, which is probably a subject for another day, but we'll look at um, a little bit of it now. But note while we can that around, along that central ridge of the Pacific, which comes down through the uh, Gulf of California. There's a mini plate uh, occurs off Mexico. Uh, there's another mini plate where the Cocos Pacific and Nazca uh, plates meet. And that's actually the Galapagos mini plate, but it's not where the Galapagos Islands are. They're over halfway 
towards uh, Ecuador. As you can see, they're labeled there above Nazca, Nazca being a companion plate to the Cocos and eastern half to the Pacific Ocean. So the main expanding zone of the Pacific Ocean is the one that runs north-south from top left to bottom left. Um, South American plate, a subject for another day, doesn't strictly include um, the region around Panama. There's another mini plate there and another mini plate uh, called the, um, uh, I think it's the little or the northern, um, northern South American plate. I can't think of the name at the moment. Anyway, that's uh, a structure of plates joining North America and South America. Remembering that um, 100 million years ago or so, South America was effectively jammed in uh, against the Gulf of Mexico, where the word North American plate is, and so was Africa. Um, we can just see an outline of Africa in the central uh, ridge. If you think of that as the bum or the, or the uh, West African bump, um, that originally came from just north of Florida, running up the um, coast towards Atlanta and so forth. And that's where um, Africa originally sat in the continent um, of Pangaea a couple of hundred million years ago. Looking again at this area in the power greys are the continental masses, North America, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean plate. You can see that it's quite complex, but largely it's a left-hand moving transverse fault. In other words, there's not so much subduction. It's more North America moving westward and South America moving eastward along that fault with only a small section in red, which is the expanding new ocean development, very limited. Um, but you have a lot of lateral movement through places like Haiti, of course, where they had a very severe earthquake uh, 10 or 12 years ago. And uh, uh, as it turns in a sort of horseshoe, um, there's a subduction occurring on the eastern end of the Caribbean plate uh, so that the uh, North American plate and the South American plate are effectively sliding in under the Antille volcanic arc. That's why the volcanoes are there. There's a big ring of volcano, volcanoes um, running um, Trinidad to the Antibes, et cetera, uh, which are in a linear pattern <coughs> following that horseshoe and uh, some couple of uh, hundred kilometers west of the subduction trench. And the North American, South American plate boundary then extends eastward um, as a sort of transfer fault, um, meaning lateral sliding rather than a lot of compression. There is compression and uh, close by there's subduction. So uh, it is a difficult thing to comment upon. Um, I suppose a comment at this point that down in this um, bottom left corner, you've got that Cocos plate subducting under Central America and the Nazca plate subducting under the South American plate, essentially. Um, the Northern Andes plate is the name I was trying to think of a few minutes ago that's cut off diagonally from the South American plate. So you think it's probably a bit pedantic to go through all these descriptions, but unless we have an understanding of the world as it is today, it's pretty damn difficult to think of the moves and changes that occurred over even a billion years, let alone uh, 4.6 billion years. So that's why I tend to do this modern plate um, structure uh, rather than get stuck into the uh, historic side of the geology. There's another rendition of this same uh, business with the uh, North American plate shown marking as 24 millimeters a year. That's always equivalent, of course, to 24 kilometers in a million years, which is the way a geologist tends to think of rate of movement. Caribbean plate moving less rapidly, but in pretty much the same direction. Hence, the net effect is um, a uh, lateral movement on the green zones at the top of the Caribbean plate, because it's 
northern section is moving faster than the southern section. Um, there would be a little bit of compression along that line too, um, as shown in Haiti in the east there with the purple. Um, red zones are expanding, green zones are sliding past one another. Purple is compression without subduction, which is more most typical of um, continental areas, like the difference between the South American plate and the uh, uh, North Andean plate, where the 23 is marked uh, just below the center of the diagram. Many of the plates there are moving uh, northwesterly, um, and even that, sub well, that counts for a subduction zone um, north of the um, Andean plate, that North Andean plate, the 23 uh, millimeters per year is subducting underneath the Caribbean plate shown by that blue line with triangles. Oh, and the Nazca plate in the south not labeled is sliding under South America and the Cocos plate moving at 67 uh, millimeters uh, a year is sliding under Mexico, hence the volcanoes around Mexico City, for example, for those of you who know Mexico City. Um, the Caribbean plate formed at the uh, Pacific uh, and sort of rolled black, a bit like a toilet roll, if you imagine on the falling on the floor and starting to roll back. Um, and uh, that's relative to America and it moved rolled back towards the east. So that if you looked at that subduction zone uh, 20 million years ago, it's probably over near the Sea of Caribbean, where now it's way over uh, into the um, Atlantic. Uh, you'll notice uh, a gray zone mark there, tectonic zone. That means there's a deal of crushing and faulting going on, mm. for earthquakes and so forth from tectonic instability, just uh, stress at that point in the plates. S is planted by earthquakes, of course, and we can see that uh, earthquake distribution. I often take these off the web without knowing what interval is involved. Uh, I suppose there may be 30 years of uh, earthquake uh, epicenters here, and we're talking really about the foci, and the colors indicate the depth. So strangely, there's not a lot of very deep ones recorded, in around Mexico City, fortunately, they're relatively deep. Um, you know, there's several hundred kilometers or 150 kilometers deep or so, shown by the green, uh, just to the southwest of Yucatan Peninsula, somewhere near Mexico City. Um, and that's the deeper section of the subduction plate of the Cocos plate. So it would be down uh, at the depth where volcanoes are generated over 100 kilometers, hence that line of volcanoes that runs through the state of Mexico uh, and further south. Other volcanoes down on the South American um, continent where uh, there's a bit of subduction locally uh, underneath the um, North um, Andes plate there in the um, crown of South America. You see some blue colors popping up there. And again, blue colors where the uh, around Trinidad and um, I can't think of all the names of the islands in that um, group in the horseshoe out on the eastern side of the Caribbean. So deep faults, deep uh, earthquakes usually result from some subduction zones. Oh, it says the area outlined is detailed in the next slide. I hope it is. Yes, in fact, it's showing that again. And um, these are recording stations for um, movement against uh, these days with GPS. One can tell whether a station is moving and at what rate. So there's fairly intense observation pattern going on in the Caribbean plate. Um, it's a very interesting place for people to work. It's quite pleasant there particularly if you're working from a boat or something, oh good. But um, you can see south of um, Cuba, the North American Caribbean plate boundary is sliding through. And then the uh, right out in the east, the NAM-SAM boundary, North American, South American plate boundary, 
even with a question line against it, much as to say, well, we're not positive that that's the true boundary because there are a number of transverse faults run out in that direction towards the um, Central Atlantic Ridge. Uh, I don't know that I've much more to say, except there are the complex small plates in the southwest quadrant, quadrant down around uh, eight o'clock, uh, with subduction zone marked under Columbia, et cetera, uh, from portion of the Caribbean plate. Um, and depths are shown by color and topography by, by color, likewise, as indicated by the um, scales in the bottom right. Uh, the word tomography, of course, used in uh, study of the human body. Uh, when we look at it, I uh, go through a <laughs> thing to get uh, uh, plates <laughs> of the um, internal organs, that's tomography. Um, and that enables probing the order of a thousand or 1200 kilometers below the sea bottom to image bits and pieces of plates that one can see down there in the uh, mantle. And uh, there are bits that have sunk beneath the present day Caribbean. Going to one more detail still, it gives you an idea of the complexity of some of these structures that represent major plate boundaries. Um, where we've got the Bahamas platform, part of the North American um, tectonic plate up above, that's the northern section of this diagram, and then the Carib Caribbean tectonic plate below. Um, well, we're getting accustomed now to those symbols for subduction in the Myrtos Trough and at um, four o'clock, or the Puerto Rica Trench uh, in the opposite direction um, above it at uh, three o'clock. Uh, not so much subduction at all in the um, western side of this diagram. It's more lateral sliding faults, all with the um, effect of the north block to the west, which is left-handed if you rotate your wrist or uh, anti-clockwise, if you think of it in that way. So when talking about a transfer fault, you usually say, oh, it's right-handed, left-handed, clockwise or anti-clockwise. Um, I hope you can understand my meaning. <laughs> Anyway, that's uh, that North American plate boundary. Just reading it now, map of the North American Caribbean tectonic plate boundary, colors to no depth below sea level and elevation on land. Numbers are years of historical earthquakes. I didn't mention this, larger than, the, larger than about M7, which are really disastrous earthquakes and quite capable of producing tsunamis. The asterisk in the center, is the Haiti earthquake of uh, 2010, so it was actually 11 years ago. Um, the barbed line boundaries, one plate or block plunges under another one, so that's subduction, we call them barbed, I guess, with little black triangles. And heavy lines with half arrows, they're faults along which two blocks pass each other laterally. They're transverse faults called transform, usually as a plate boundary where they join uh, different types of uh, plate boundary. For example, the Orient Fault running from nine o'clock eastwards um, effectively joins into subduction zone uh, in the Puerto Rico Trench. So it's a transferring the style of movement rather than just a plain transverse fault. Ooh, isochrons, what are isochrons? They're lines indicating rocks of similar age, uh, isochron. Uh, so in the oceanic crust, if we take the Atlantic, which is quite simple and the first uh, region to have this determined, was there's a central ridge where uh, crust, oceanic crust is being formed today. And the older crust is then displaced laterally. So you get a mirror image effect uh, from the center of the ocean. And this applies, say, for the North American plate, which I outlined in black on this diagram. We've just come through from the Caribbean, that um, block in the center, out to the central ridge, which is the point we started this discussion, really. And um, if you put ages on these bands, which is quite possible with modern uh, dredging and technology, firstly, the bands can be mapped 
by magnetics of the ocean floor. I'll go into that if anyone questions me. Um, the rock samples will give you an age and then being able to make, you might say, a, a chart of the ocean floor magnetics and compare it to ages collected from rock samples. And this way we can correlate two oceans and show that the Pacific Ocean, for example, which is expanding from the red zone, um, that's the central Pacific Ridge, which is coming out of the Gulf of California and going due south in this diagram, in this plan. Um, we see that the zones are very much wider. Now that implies that the Pacific is opening at three or four times the rate that the Atlantic has opened, uh, or is opening still. The red zone is very much wider. That's the new crust formed in the last five or 10 um, million years is um, spread over hundreds of kilometers, really. Uh, whereas in the Atlantic, it's restricted, well, I don't know whether, maybe a hundred kilometers. But um, suffice to say, uh, this enables us to look at the tectonics of the globe today and see which oceans are new, which oceans are expanding most rapidly, which preserve the oldest uh, rocks. And here, the Atlantic preserves blue colored rocks, which if we look at that bottom diagram, um, you've got uh, dates running along that from zero in the red, being that's volcanic rocks forming new ocean crust today. Get to the yellows and you're about 50 million or 56 million, I see there go into greens, 80, 90 or 100 million year old crust, light blues 140, and the ultimate is 180 million years, MA meaning million N. Now I usually use small MY just because uh, for a personal reason, it makes it easier to understand a million year. Uh, but look at that, the Atlantic, Central Atlantic was opening uh, we don't know the rest of the Pacific, of course. We've lost the half of that under the North and South American continents. It's been subducted. So there's no ocean crust of that age left. The only relic is in the Gulf of Mexico when the uh, North American plate expanded somewhat uh, about 150 million years ago. So that's one of the places on Earth where we see some old crust. The other one is in the far west of the Pacific near the Philippines. So that gives a pretty good look at the southern half of the North American plate and uh, its relationship to the oceans around it. Um, new ocean still forming in the Atlantic. It's never been as rapid in the North Atlantic as in the Central Rapid Atlantic, nor did it start as early. So the rift began in the Central Atlantic um, Later, it began somewhere just after the green, somewhere around 50, 60 million years ago, which is about the time we separated from Antarctica, and it started to split in the north. And one could run around the plate, except that the Arctic Ocean doesn't have such a good quality um, map of the isochrons. So with those word, new words, I'll pass on. Uh, just going back to that uh, pattern of plates, the Pacific plate in the west, the Cocos plate uh, expanding from it and sliding in under Mexico, uh, Nazca plate not labelled, it too has one section, it's rather complex, but uh, um, it's got one section uh, sliding in under the um, uh, northern section of, um, Af of South America. Uh, and I see the name is written there as uh, North Andes plate, which is crushing a bit or being crushed by um, South America proper on that purple line. And uh, I won't go on in detail about plates now, we've discussed that all before, but I've marked in the volcanic arc um, west of the Antille there as a red zone, three o'clock. And that's only just been added because we talked about it. Notice there's a tiny little plate, the Riviera mini plate up at 10 o'clock. Um, so when 
plates meet, there's a tendency to be interaction and fracturing, which gives little plates. And one of the smallest of all is the Galapagos mini plate um, down at eight o'clock, um, where the Cocos, Nazca, and Pacific plates meet. As I said before, um, that's not where the Galapagos Islands are today. So we'll have a bit of a break from all that heavy geology stuff. And uh, I don't know how many of you, I won't break to ask a comment, but you can tell me afterwards, been to the Galapagos, we've only had a week or so there, uh, but a very enjoyable one. And uh, in particular today, I was just going to talk about this area, that one of the areas that Darwin landed on and spent a couple of days early in his uh, interval at the Galapagos. Uh, so that red spot up at 12 o'clock, of course, is where the Galapagos are. They lie on the Nazca plate, strictly speaking today, but they haven't always been there. There's a real debate about um, history, but they certainly seem to have been at some stage relatively recently, 10, 12 million years ago, perhaps on the Cocos plate. But the red spot has probably played uh, been constant in position over time. And many people suggest that originally the plate boundary of the Pacific plate, Nazca and Cocos plates, a triple point that lies out to the west today, was over this point. And uh, there's good reasons for uh, presenting that too for the origin, initial origin of the Galapagos uh, island group and the volcanic mass which is called a large igneous province of the Galapagos, which underlies present day volcanoes. Um, I don't need to go into more detail of the other plates because um, that's a matter for discussing South America. Ooh, can that have anything to do with, uh, probably not much to do with the uh, um, Galapagos, except that the Cocos plate, uh, I've put a subduction zone in case one's vague about those things, uh, sliding in underneath the um, Caribbean plate uh, and then causing volcanism along the um, Panama Peninsula uh, through as far as Mexico and the USA, of course. So it's a simple matter of um, oceanic crust in dark green sliding in under continental crust, which is thicker in green too and uh, resulting in this uh, earthquake arc uh, or line of earthquakes 100 or two kilometers easterly of the subduction trench, which is out to sea. So that's the movement of the Cocos plate, uh, sliding in under North America at uh, 67 millimeters a year, or 67 kilometers in a million years, which is more the way the geologist thinks of it. And here we have the mass of earthquakes resulting from that, and uh, one very severe one in um, uh, the Panama region. Uh, I haven't got the details of that for you today, but um, the Nazca plate to the south of it, and a whole series of active volcanoes on the Galapagos, shown by the red triangles. And in fact, uh, the red triangles uh, continue. Uh, in in the Panama region and uh, across the Caribbean plate boundary all the way through into Mexico, et cetera. So um, that is the picture uh, as we see it. Um, the Galapagos Islands have two broad zones uh, of um, oceanic uh, high running off one due eastwards and one uh, north eastwards. And these are effectively the trace of the extinct uh, Galapagos Islands. So that as plates move, of course, they take away the um, uh, extinct volcanoes from the active center, which has come right up 3000 kilometers or so from the um, outer core of the earth. And uh, that seems to be constant in time, but uh, in this case, as I said, uh, the Cocos plate seems to have been over the um, focus of that um, large igneous province 
uh, in relatively recent times. I think it's only 10 million years or something like that. But there are two trends. The Cocos Plate is carrying away um, extinct volcanic centres into the subduction zone under the Caribbean Plate. Uh, whereas the Nazca plate is carrying them away to disappear under the North Andean plate. Um, so there are extinct volcanoes that forming that uh, ridge line or those two ridge lines. And the activity at the uh, uh, Galapagos is relatively recent. I mean, I don't think there are any uh, volcanoes older than about 5 million years um, actually exposed at the Galapagos. But of course, they're erupting all the time and destroying themselves as well. Just one more, how do we explain these divergent volcanic submarine plateaus? They're outlined in black, one sliding in under that little Panama block. Uh, and there's another parallel one up to the north due to an active hotspot uh, along just off the East Pacific rise. Um, and these show the fairly consistent movement of the Cocos plate. Now the Nazca plate is not as simple as that. Um, and I won't try and uh, explain its movement, but clearly the net effect has been um, to the east southeast, as seen by the extinct line or line of extinct um, volcanoes forming that ridge to the south. So um, I hope you get that picture that um, uh, the plates have been moving effectively um, eastward from the hot spots, either northeastwards or south, slightly southeastward, and have taken away the edifice of volcanoes. And they've got, no longer got a source of magma, so they become extinct as they get further east. There's another picture of that. Those ridges are called the Cocos Ridge and the Carnegie Ridge. Um, one might expect from the direction of movement of the Nazca Plate that that uh, Carnegie Ridge would follow the line of open circles, which I've put onto the diagram, but it is a more complex plate movement due to, uh, the, uh, due to the complexities of the expansion as it goes towards the Panama plate. And uh, the net result is that the uh, Carnegie Ridge runs almost east-west. And I've written there, the submarine ridges are extinct volcanoes carried away from the Galapagos hotspot by plate movement and that's spreading essentially from the Galapagos fracture zone. There's also spreading, of course, from the uh, mid-Pacific plate boundary in the west there. And the Nazca plate is more complex than shown. Um, so the Carnegie Ridge is actually, um, look, goes eastward. And there's the pattern of earthquakes, which shows, you know, helps to define plate margins it's pretty extraordinary. I haven't tried to define them in terms of depth, but you can see that red is the shallowest near the trench. Yellow, probably a matter of um, uh, 50 to so millimeter, uh, kilometers depth. Green, maybe 70. Blue, perhaps 100 plus uh, kilometers depth. And they are at depth only in the regions of subduction zones. In the case of transfer faults or central expanding ridge in the oceans, you don't tend to get deep earthquakes because it's only magma moving. It's not as if it's great plates sliding against one another. All right, well, um, Kay and I visited the islands. One can't give you years, <laughs> seven or eight years ago. <laughs> and uh, our main well, we went visited a number of islands, but uh, I've got the circle around the one I'm just discussed a bit today. Um, it's well, it's not regarded as uh, volcanically active, although there has been an eruption since the 1850s when um, Darwin visited this area. The main active volcano today is there in the southwest corner, the Isabella Island, um, Negra, Vol Negra volcano. Um, but uh, it's quite an active hotspot, and it would be expected that the main eruptions would be in the west because the plate has been moving uh, essentially eastward across it. And it results, and uh, uh, 
hence as they get further east they'll cool be eroded tend to subside anyway from the cooling uh, and uh, go below sea level so that's a general story of uh, the galapagos geology i guess apart from the fact that they're all basaltic volcanoes uh, representing fairly true composition of the Earth's mantle. I guess those are oceanic uh, uh, symbols, the um, half arrows going everywhere. That must be the southern um, cold uh, continental movement, which brings such a rich um, uh, nutrient to these islands and hence the um, great flora and fauna, submarine floras and uh, uh, and the beat on them. Uh, Charles Darwin, the Beagle, 1835, 35, I was saying 50 before, I was forgetting it, well before uh, he wrote uh, this up. Uh, well, maybe he wrote it up in the Voyage of the Beagle, not so much in the uh, uh, Origin of Species in the 1850s, but he procrastinated quite a long time. Now, uh, geologizing in a volcanic country is most delightful. Besides the interest attached to itself, it leads you into the most beautiful and, re and retired spots. Some of the craters uh, mounting the larger islands are of immense size and rise to a height of between three and 4,000 feet. Their flanks are studded by innumerable smaller, I can't read that, something orifices. I scarcely hesitate to affirm that there must be in the whole archipelago at least 2,000 craters. These consist of uh, lava and scoria, or finely stratified sandstone like tuff. That's the word for um, uh, volcanic ash, tuff. So if we strike that, um, it's not tough, it's tuff. Most of the latter are beautifully symmetrical. They owe their origin to eruptions of volcanic mud without any lava. I realize I didn't include any in, in this particular uh, presentation. Okay, so there are those islands again and the red spot, uh, Sullivan Bay region, uh, where we showed our interest. It does give you a little bit of subsea topography. You can probably see the um, Galapagos fault structure running across the top of the diagram, essentially east-west, and the submarine ridge east of, uh, uh, south east of the islands themselves, Aperto Bacuzio Moreno. I can't pronounce these things, of course. Anyway, that's the active center of volcanism today in the ridge uh, as the volcanoes cool and erode, they subside below sea level. The whole area of the Galapagos would be arched due to the heat of the hot spot underneath it, which is coming these 3000 kilometers or so from the outer core. There we are again, the Galapagos hotspot, and it has been on the Cocos plate until you know, really geologically relatively recent times. So that means the um, boundaries between the Nazca and Cocos Plate have changed, we believe, and not the hotspot itself. We think that has been consistent, um, but there'll be debate about this, I imagine, or there is in press. Um, suffice to say, uh, it's partially that, or that entirely that, that explains how you uh, see the two ridges running away, otherwise it would only be one ridge on the Nazca plate. And those who argue that um, originally the little Galapagos plate was above the hotspot and the whole boundary of the Galapagos fault um, would have been uh, uh, central on the structure over the uh, red spot. Uh, hence the Pacific rise may well have moved westward, but this is quite a debate that goes on academically. There's that little plate. Is quite a miniature beauty, and they're even determined around it patches of the plate margin that are under pressure but not subducting. That's in purple, uh, are expanding as shown in red, or actually sliding past one another as shown in green. So it's amazing what they can do on the deep sea floor. Uh, it's probably five to seven thousand meters of ocean depth there. And the Galapagos platelet is very small, but it has truly divergent plate boundaries and is a long way from the Galapagos hotspot today. And we can see that the um, main Pacific uh, 
plate is um, diverging from that um, mid-ocean ridge at 95 millimetres a year. So it goes almost 100 kilometres every million years. And uh, the Nazca plate moving at a, a slightly oblique uh, east-northeasterly direction is moving only half that pace. Um, so as you can see, there's complexities involved. And the Cocos plate showing uh, a sort of equal distance or equal um, uh, orientation between the Galapagos fault zone and the Central Pacific um, mid-ridge going up um, diagonally at 67 kilometres a year. Or cheat sheet for my work on the Galapagos. They're the oldest volcanoes, are only four to five million years old. Uh, they're on the equator effectively, 16 island islands, they're all volcanic. Um, and it's the uh, Fernando in the west is uh, the most active, I should say. And uh, it's less than half a million years old. So it's been over the hot spot for that length of time, but will gradually move eastward and away in a million years or so and be no longer an active centre. Um, so you have a convergence of the southeast and northeast trade winds from the North and South Americas, and hence uh, surface waters uh, clearly um, bring in, I suppose you'd say, trash or bring in uh, a good deal of um, uh, plankton and so forth, which helps the uh, uh, feeding of animals. And the currents also meet from Peru, Panama, Panama, and also deep cold currents. Can't read the bit about, but would ultimately go to uh, New Guinea and, uh, and the hum uh, or from New Guinea, I would imagine, because there's a surface um, warm current that goes in the opposite direction. And that gives us uh, most of our big weather patterns, of course. And the um, Antarctic Humboldt current brings a lot of nutrient from the south. And upwelling against the um, volcanic ridge is the reason for enrichment around the islands, and particularly around the Western Island, I believe. And the rich micronutrient nutrients give rise to um, small um, sub microscopic plants or microscopic plants, and uh, you get enormous um, blooms of microplankton. And partly they rely on iron that's derived from the basalts. So a lot of the red microplankton, like uh, blood cells, carry uh, trace iron or significant iron in them. Um, the wind and bird carried seeds, mangroves, cacti, spiders, insects, etc. Beetles, floating wood with carpenter bee larvae arrived on the uh, islands. And all this has gone on over, I suppose, tens of millions of years. By the same token, to reach any one island, it has to occur within a million years or so. Hence, uh, if tortoise was three million years ago, and maybe the um, uh, large uh, sea turtles have also come in, not the tortoise so much, but the sea turtles more recently. But the tortoise has had about um, three million years of evolution, they believe, and was derived from South America. And uh, also, of course, our little swimming reptiles and the penguins and seals. The shags there are now wingless. Um, no, no concern for a shag, I imagine. All they want is a good um, swimming function. Um, enough said, I think, on that. So that's that area of Sullivan Bay, and the red spot is where Darwin uh, landed, except that uh, there's been a lava flow down that valley subsequent to 1835 when the Beagle came into this bay. And uh, uh, every mound we see is a volcanic centre, so Darwin really enjoyed himself, and that spine that sticks out uh, near the uh, near the vessel is um, um, an old volcanic uh, conduit or neck, uh, which is eroded to a point. So it would have filled the um, conduit up which volcanic material was originally derived. Um, and all of this 
we uh, uh, less than a million years old, apart from that red spot area, which is only a uh, hundred years or so, less than a hundred years. And all sorts of things have washed up on the islands, and that's one of them. That's my uh, wife Kay, my good <laughs> wife Kay, who arranges all these trips for me, and uh, she particularly Kay enjoyed the uh, uh, <laughs> the diving there, and she came ashore much as the turtles did. You know, struggled her way up the beach with flippers and, and so forth. Appears to be a little boy there, just uh, beyond her too, doesn't it? But um, she made the most of every minute. And the seals couldn't help laughing. They just couldn't help laughing at her. So they sat in the shallows and thought, what a floundering animal this one is. And we haven't seen the likes of her. But uh, Darwin would actually have seen this surface of lava because uh, he may well have stood at this point and admired the uh, spine in the distance and perhaps the beagle vessel sitting out there from which he'd come. Uh, but there'd now be... Uh, uh, three or four metres of lava covering that point. And this is probably good um, uh, pahoehoe lava. If anyone's Hawaiian, they may correct me to pahoehoe. But uh, it's uh, ropey lava to some people. And that's basaltic lava at its best. Now you can imagine that um, a matter of 60 years ago was red hot and certainly would not have uh, borne walking upon. But other things have landed already, of course. And the iguanas uh, um, munch around on the um, submarine uh, weeds and little red crab in the bottom right-hand corner. Likewise, there are hundreds of those around in the right spots. Um, but looking in detail at the surface of that uh, ropey lava, hoi hoi lava, um, we can see there's a plenty of um, perhaps uh, 300 millimetres or something like that of um, thickness to this particular sheet. Uh, a lot of air bubbles in it, uh, but haven't been escaping to the surface, which must have solidified quickly. But little, little uh, bulges of magma are trying to get up through the cracks or have sunk into the cracks, I should say. So the crack may well have been very early and uh, one can picture that uh, in red hot condition. Would have been uh, something the order of 1200 degrees to be fluid like that, uh, which wouldn't, your book would not last long upon that. And uh, there we see a collapsed section uh, where perhaps lava flowing underneath it has uh, moved on. And you often get very significant caves, lava caves formed by a river of lava flowing under a carapace of solidified um, basalt. We have those here in the southeast, the Biodeck Caves and others. Um, uh, there's one at Mount Eccles, if anyone has visited Mount Eccles, uh, and walk into the mouth of a beautiful hemispherical cave. So these are basaltic flows. That's just a look, you can see the coloration by oxidized iron uh, in that surface layer and uh, the air bubbles, the very top of it, that have managed to find their way to the surface to be blocked by the glassy basalt that's formed on the uh, quick chill, quickly chilled crown of the flow. And out of the lava comes all sorts of other little creepies <laughs> and crawlies. <laughs> okay, again, enjoying herself to the best of, I hate to see her, I didn't want to see her disappear here. She's playing for the ticket. Um, and other things have already managed to make their uh, take their existence in the cracks. Hardly any soil to develop on, but um, uh, wind-blown, bird-carried seeds have already established. Darwin would have been fascinated to move over the surface, which was uh, brand new soon after his arrival. And even down in shoreline areas, cacti, uh, getting a go on in the uh, rock pile at the point probably it reached the, the flow reached the sea. And just another view of this. Uh, uh, I didn't put in any of the other more broken um, clinter-like uh, lavas, which are called ah, -ah 
AAA R lovers. They're the different form. They're often on the margins of the flows. I don't think I included any today. We'll do another one on um, on the uh, uh, Galapagos or organism just to show the difference of the material that's carried and broken. You can imagine that crustal zone broken up and pushed sideways. It doesn't look like the same basalt that's been oxidized. And here's one of the muddy things that Darwin referred to. It was actually on our climb up the hill where that first view, uh, you get uh, um, volcanic ash that's uh, boiled effectively, bubbles of steam coming up through forming mini volcanoes. That area would only be um, two or four, two to four square meters, I'd imagine. So we'd be allowed to stand in there in COVID times. Well, um, here we are, the oldest volcanoes, only four to five million years old. Oh, this is, I showed this one before, uh, I think. Um, yeah, I did. So I won't read it all through for, for Atlantic. Yeah, I'll leave it on and uh, uh, see if anyone would um, buy I can't leave it on, can I? I'll leave it on just for a minute or two. You might like to, for a minute, and you'd like to read through it. But then uh, we'll go to questions. Anyone got anything to say now? I guess you can all um, comment now. Kay, can you hear me to speak? Yep, I can hear you. Yep, then I can hear you. Yep, that, so we was, can talk. that was extremely interesting. Uh, actually, it's a pity Suzanne wasn't here for this session because she was the one who asked about the Galapagos. Originally, yes. Yeah, no. I asked about um, Iceland, but she mm. was dead Iceland, keen to hear about Galapagos. So hopefully she can get it on the recording. Well, I'll uh, I imagine in a week or so with um, Stuart's help, I'll get these um, edited because I have to cut off those first four or five minutes. Otherwise, people will wonder what the hell is things all about, you know, with us just tuning in. And uh, I have not yet uh, gained the skill to get at these. Once upon a time I could, but I've forgotten the principles now, um, entering everything and editing. Um, are there any questions today? In the, at one stage there was an iguana that looked very like um, an Australian iguana and I was wondering if the Antarctic plate, um, if they'd both come originally from the Antarctic plate when it was, wasn't was cold. Oh, I rather doubt that. In fact, uh, I don't know my Australian reptiles. Are you thinking of the uh, goanna type? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It looked like an Australian wild animal to me, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe it wasn't like that, well, I don't know. But you'd have to think, um, Celia, that they're all connected somewhere. I mean, you get iguana in South America, you get them in Indonesia, or monitor lizards, they've got to all have come from the same place originally, yeah. you know, yeah. maybe even like, pan uh, well, I don't, yeah, there's so many spread around the world, aren't there? Yeah. Yeah, but I would say not from the Antarctic, I mean, uh -huh. um, for a start, I don't believe there's any uh, iguana type things currently on the Antarctic. You'd be talking uh, significantly many years ago. Uh, well, if it was a close land connection for Australia, it's 50 million years and no different for the Americas, really. I think the most likely thing is from uh, South America. Uh, it's not a difficult thing to believe they um, were carried across in logs or something that have, or um, masses of vegetation that have come down a major river from the Andes and washed out into the uh, ocean, just mm -hmm. by chance carried across to the volcanic islands. Uh -huh. And that would have happened for the tortoise three million years ago. And I think it's well established that that's come from South America uh -huh. and that it's had three million years of evolution working from its chromosomes in its present position or in the various islands. They differ, of course. The tortoise is different on, on uh, various islands. There must be four or five recognisable um, land tortoise. And uh, these have evolved separately, even in a matter of probably 
hundreds of thousands, less than a hundred thousand years on the separate islands. Mm. And the same has happened uh, with the birds. Uh, yes, so it's been a really interesting study, of course, to look at these brand new islands and see what first um, uh, things are that uh, take hold and, uh, and which dominates after a period. All very well. If you haven't uh, more questions, perhaps we'll just close it now. And uh, um, I think we could continue discussion. But while I'm open, it's going to keep recording. And if you don't have anything in by way of questions, I might as well just close it off. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the the section about the South America, South, the south part of the North American plate, got a bit confusing there it is very complex isn't it yes and if i can watch it again on the recording that would be real useful fine and i will do although i have not yet done uh north american plate in summary and obviously i wouldn't give it much more time than i've given today but i think you can regard that uh, plate boundary as the north american plate mostly sliding um away and the uh, uh, Caribbean plate having um, moved eastward. Um, if you think of it, some sort of the Caribbean plate is a sort of a hinge between the movement of two great masses of North and South America. So something happened that had to happen in there to allow so much movement. And the Caribbean plate um, is a funny structure. And there's another one to the south of South America. Uh, which accounts for the Sandwich Islands, which we'll also get to discuss. In fact, there's another um, in the um, Gibraltar region um, coming out of the Mediterranean, a horseshoe-shaped subduction zone sliding out through uh, Gibraltar. So where huge plates meet, um, there appears that you get these funny um, horseshoe-typed corrections with a subduction zone slipping away. Mm. Um, there's another one, in fact, north of Australia called the Banda Arc in Indonesia, where the great trend coming down the volcanic subduction zone comes down Sumatra, Java, and into the um, past Timor, and then takes a big horseshoe swing back to the uh, west again in the Banda Sea region, the Banda Arc, and that's accommodating the northward movement of the Australian plate, quite southward movement of Eurasian plate, westward movement of Pacific plate. The net effect is to form some sort of small hinge in there. And, uh, and the small um, horseshoe shaped subduction zone uh, retreats, uh, or um, uh, I can only say um, you get withdrawal of the subduction, as I said, a bit, a bit like a toilet roll and rolling itself. Uh, and uh, they're often quite rapid movements. Mm. Mm. Yes, it's complex. <laughs> and we had one in, we believe we had one in New South Wales uh, 400 million years ago. That's why we have to really think of discussing these things in the present day before I start telling you, you know, the Oracline concept of New South Wales or something or other with, with a subduction zone disappearing towards Queensland. Um, it's uh, really too much to take 400 million years ago if we haven't seen something of it in the present day. Um, that gets the name Macquarie Arc um, in Australia. <laughs>